can you take me through the full procedure for implanting, say, the N1 sure. chip in your link? Yeah, it's a really simple, really simple, straightforward procedure. Uh, the, the human part of the surgery uh, that, that I do is dead simple. It's one of the most basic neurosurgery procedures imaginable. And I, I think there's evidence that it some version of it has been done for thousands of years. Uh, that there are examples, I think, from ancient Egypt of healed or partially healed uh, trephinations and from uh, Peru or you know ancient times in South America uh, where uh, these proto-surgeons would drill holes in people's skulls, you know, presumably to let out the evil spirits, but maybe to drain blood clots. And there's evidence of bone healing around the edge, meaning the people at least survive some months uh, after a procedure. And so what we're doing is that. We are making a cut in the skin on the top of the head over the area of the brain that is the most potent uh, representation of hand intentions. And so if you th if you are an expert concert pianist, you know, this part of your brain is lighting up the entire time you're playing. Uh, we call it the hand knob. The hand knob. Yeah. So it's all the, like the finger movements, all this, all, yeah. all of that is just firing away. Yep. There's a little squiggle in the cortex right there. One of the folds in the brain is kind of doubly folded right on that spot. And so you can look at it on an MRI and say, that's the hand knob. And then you, you do a functional test in a special kind of, MRI called an, a functional MRI, fMRI. And this part of the brain lights up when people, even quadriplegic people whose brains aren't connected to their finger movements anymore, they th imagine finger movements and this part of the brain still lights up. So we can ID that part of the brain in anyone who's preparing to enter our trial and say, okay, that, that part of the brain we confirm is your hand intention area. Um, and so uh, I'll make a little cut in the skin. We'll flap the skin open, just like kind of opening the hood of a car, only a lot smaller. Make a perfectly round uh, one inch diameter hole in the skull. Remove that bit of skull. Uh, open the lining of the brain, the covering of the brain. It's like a, like a little bag of water that the brain floats in. And then show that part of the brain to our robot and then the, this is where the robot shines. It can come in and take these tiny, you know, much smaller than human hair electrodes and precisely insert them into the cortex, into the surface of the brain to a very precise depth in a very precise spot that avoids all the blood vessels that are coating the surface of the brain. And after the robot's done with its part, then, you know, the human comes back in and puts the implant into that hole in the skull and covers it up, uh, screwing it down to the skull and sewing the skin back together. Uh, so the whole thing is, you know, a few hours long. It's extremely low risk compared to the average neurosurgery involving the brain that that might say open up a deep part of the brain or manipulate blood vessels in the brain. Uh, this this opening on the surface of the brain with um, with only cortical microinsertions carries um, significantly less risk than a, a lot of the you know tumor or aneurysm surgeries that are routinely done. So cortical microinsertions that are via robot and computer vision are designed to avoid the blood vessels. Exactly. So uh, I know you're a bit biased here, but let's compare human and machine. Sure. So what are hu human surgeons able to do well and what are robot surgeons able to do well at this stage of our human civilization development yeah yeah that's a good question um humans uh, are general purpose machines we're able to adapt to unusual situations we're able to change the plan on the fly um i remember well a surgery that I was doing many years ago down in San Diego where the plan was to um, open a small hole behind the ear and go reposition a blood vessel that had come to lay on 
the facial nerve, the trigeminal nerve, uh, the nerve that goes to the face, when that blood vessel lays on the nerve, it can cause just intolerable, horrific shooting pain that people describe like being zapped with a cattle prod. And so the beautiful, elegant surgery is to go move this blood vessel off the, off the nerve. The surgery team, we, we went in there and started moving this blood vessel and then found that there was a giant aneurysm on that blood vessel that was not easily visible on the pre-op scans. And so the plan had to dynamically change and that the um, human surgeons had no problem with that. We're trained for all those things. Robots wouldn't do so well in that situation, at least in their current incarnation, uh, fully robotic surgery like you know, the, the electrode insertion portion of, of the Neuralink surgery, it goes according to a set plan. And so uh, the humans can interrupt the flow and change the plan, but the robot can't really change the plan midway through. It operates according to how it was programmed and how it was asked to run. It does its job very precisely, uh, but not with a wide degree of latitude and how to react to changing conditions. So there could be just a very large number of ways that you could be surprised as a surgeon. When you enter a situation, there could be yep. subtle things that you have to dynamically adjust to. Correct. And robots are not good at that. Currently. Currently. I think uh, we are at the dawn of a new era with AI of the parameters for robot responsiveness to be dramatically broadened. Right, I mean, you can't look at a self-driving car and say that it's operating under very narrow parameters. You know, if a chicken runs across the road, it wasn't necessarily programmed to deal with that specifically, but it, a Waymo or a self-driving Tesla would have no problem reacting to that appropriately. Uh, and so surgical robots aren't there yet, but give it time. And then there could be a lot of sort of inter, like semi-autonomous possibilities of maybe a robotic surgeon could say this situation is perfectly familiar or the situation is not familiar. And in the not familiar case, a human could take over. But basically like be very conservative and saying, okay, this for sure has no issues, no surprises, and then let the humans deal with the surprises with the edge cases, all that. Yeah. Uh, that's one possibility. So, like, you, you think eventually uh, you'll be out of the job. Well, you being neurosurgeon, your job being neurosurgeon. Humans, there will not be many neurosurgeons left on this earth. I'm not worried about m my job in my in the course of my professional life. I think I I would tell my my kids not necessarily to go in this line of work, uh, depending on. <laughs> depending on how things look in 20 years. It's so fascinating because I, I mean, I, if I have a line of work, I would say it's programming. And if you ask me like for the last, I don't know, 20 years, what I would recommend for people, if I, would, I would tell them, yeah, go, like, there's just, you will always have a job if you're a programmer because yeah. there's more and more computers and all this kind of stuff and uh, it pays well. But then you you realize these large language models come along and they're really damn good at generating code. Yeah. So it's overnight you could be surprised like, wow, like, what is the contribution of the human really? But then you start to think, okay, it does seem that humans have ability, like you said, to deal with novel situations. And in the case of programming, it's the ability to kind of come up with novel ideas to solve problems it's it seems like machines aren't quite yet able to do that and when the stakes are very high when it's life critical as it is in surgery especially in neurosurgery then it starts the the stakes are very high for a robot to actually replace a human but it's fascinating that in this case of Neuralink, there's a uh, human robot collaboration yeah yeah it's i do the parts it can't do and it does the parts i can't do um, and we we are friends. <laughs> uh, the, I I saw that there's a lot of practice going on. So I mean, everything in Neuralink is is tested extremely rigorously. But one of the things I saw that there's a proxy on which the surgeries are performed. Yeah. So this is both for the robot and for the human, for everybody involved in the entire pipeline. Yep. What's that like? 
practicing the surgery. It's pretty intense. Uh, so there's no analog to this in human surgery. Uh, human surgery is sort of this artisanal craft that's handed down directly from master to pupil over the generations. Yes. I mean, literally the way you learn to be a, a, a surgeon on humans is by doing surgery on humans. I mean, first you watch uh, your professors do a bunch of surgery, and then finally they put you know the trivial parts of the surgery into your hands, and then more, the more complex parts. And as your understanding of the the point and the purposes of the surgery increases, you get more responsibility in the perfect condition. It doesn't always go well. In Neuralink's case, the approach is a bit different. Um, we, of course, practiced as far as we could on animals. We did hundreds of animal surgeries. Um, and when it came time to do the first human, uh, we had a just an amazing team of engineers build incredibly lifelike models. Uh, one of the engineers, Fran Romano in particular, built, built a pulsating brain in a custom 3D printed skull that matches exactly the the patient's anatomy, uh, including their face and uh, scalp characteristics. And so when I was able to practice that, I mean, it, it's as close as it really reasonably should get uh, to to being the real thing in all the details, including, you know, the having a, a mannequin body attached to this custom head. And so when we were doing the practice surgeries, we'd wheel that body into the CT scanner and take a mock CT scan and wheel it back in and conduct all the normal safety checks verbally, you know, stop. This patient we're confirming his identification is mannequin number, blah, blah, blah. And then opening the brain in exactly the right spot using standard operative neuronavigation equipment standard surgical drills in a, in the same OR that we do all of our practice surgeries in at, at Neuralink and having the skull open and have the brain pulse which adds a degree of difficulty for the robot to you know perfectly precisely plan and insert those electrodes to the right depth and location and so uh yeah we we uh, kind of broke new ground on how extensively we practiced for this surgery